Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jackie, and I'm so glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. This first song that we're going to sing just reminds us of the truth that are in the Bible, um, those promises that we can believe that God will certainly fulfill. And I wanted to share with you, um, part of the song comes from Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And that verse says, And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. And if you believe that promise, if you believe that we can take God at his word, why don't you stand up and join us in singing this morning. Say it, I'll believe it. I've seen. 
the Lord. You may be seated, church. Got a few quick announcements, but we're really glad you're here today. Those in attendance and those online, we're just very, very thankful you've chosen to be part of what the Lord's doing here. Um, like I said, a few quick announcements. Um, the first one, and that was in the book, I'm going to go over some that's in your bulletins. I have found that not everyone reads what we send out. So I don't understand. But anyway, uh, April, April and I just want to, again, just say thank you. Like, this is our fourth Sunday. It's incredible to think. Like, it's already been a month. But we are thankful to be part of what God is doing here. And we just want to express our sincerest gratitude for how you have made our family already part of your family. So we're thankful for that. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, we have tonight. Tonight is the kickoff of our Vacation Bible School. Yes, really, really excited about that. We have some kids registered. I want to say one, you know, thank you to those that's been putting it together with all the planning and prepping behind the scenes, and then all our volunteers. Like, like, I'm just very, very thankful that we've had a group of people rally behind this. So, so with that being said, you can thank them later if you run into them. But be praying for it this week that these kids encounter Jesus in a real way. Amen. Amen. Uh, yeah, and then um, I should have said um, it, it may be a hair quieter here today because April is out. Um, wonder, want, some, some of you may need to, like, encourage me today. Um, <laughs> no, Wonder has a summer cold. We didn't want to give that to everyone. Um, the, the next, we have two more things, and then we're going to greet one another, and then we're going to move forward. But we do have prayer rooms starting next Sunday night at 6 p.m. in the chapel upstairs. Okay, it's going to be a time of worship, prayer, and intercession. In the bulletin, there is a sheet. It's an extra sheet. Please read that. We are looking for folks that's going to eventually help partner and volunteer by way of either helping with musicianship, I guess instrumentation, and prayer, worship. Anyway, it's in there. We need people's help, okay, because we are going to seek after God together, and we're going to see the Lord change this city for the glory of the Lord. The last thing, we're gonna, I'm going to say this, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to greet one another. But, but uh, uh, Scott Dolash had texted me early this morning and said that last night that his daddy, Don, went to be with the Lord. Okay? And so um, we want to, one, express our sincerest condolences to them. We're going to pray for the family. Once the church office, we receive... Um, Details, we'll distribute that to everyone to let everyone know. We, we just don't know yet. But, but Scott asked that we would be in prayer for his mama and his family. And so we're going to pray right now. And after we pray and say amen, I want you to greet one another, okay? So Jesus, we would pray that you would just be close to the Dolash family right now. We celebrate, and we will do this later on, we, we celebrate a life well lived serving you and adoring you. But I would pray that you would be closer than a brother in this hour, God. I pray that you would comfort those who mourn, as you say you do in your word. And I would pray, Lord, that they would see your goodness and kindness in the midst of loss in their family. So we bless them today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you greet one another, church?
said, if I ate what you ate, I would have heartburn for a week. <laughs>
give him praise. Amen. Love that. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Um, I'm going to call the teenagers. Maddie, you guys can stay up here. But before we call the teenagers up, we're going to 
we are going to pray. Actually, let me get situated. We're actually going to do a couple of things. Well, one thing, but a couple of ways. We're going to pray for an offering. Now, we have, we're not taking the baskets around, but I want to point out a couple of ways that you can give and sow into what the Lord's doing here, okay? All right, so they got it up on the screen. So you can do it by dropping it in the box that's in the back, all right? For those with a smartphone, you can zoom in and take a picture of that QR code, and it'll take you directly to where you can give online, all right? You can text to give, all right? I can't read that far away. I think 319, it's in front of me. How about that? I can't read that either. No, 319-343-3939. You can text to give, and, uh, and it'll prompt you through that process, or you can mail it to the church or drop it off upstairs. Um, I'd just be remiss. The Lord has really blessed my family and I over the years through just being faithful, and I want to encourage you to do that. So we're going to pray over that, um, and then we're going to move forward. But Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to give. I thank you for the opportunity to sow into your kingdom. I thank you that it's the one area in your word that you said, trust you in this. And so, Lord, we trust you. We not only trust you with our salvation, but we trust you with every facet of our life, God. And so we pray you bless it. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, we're, I'm going to ask if there's any teenagers or workers that went to camp this week, come on up here. And uh, we're going to share about what the Lord did in people's hearts this week. Come on up here. Amen. So it's a big deal. I believe we sent, it was it 10, Manny, 10? Nine youth. Yeah. Nine youth and several workers. Um, and uh, just really thankful. I actually went down with Kirk Friday night uh, to pick them up. And, and uh, just really, they looked tired. <laughs> they looked tired. But really thankful for what the Lord did. I'm going to start with the teens and end with you two, okay? But Christian, just take, take just a few seconds and share what the Lord did there, all right? Um, well, I mean, probably my favorite part of the camp was being able, there was, <clears throat> after uh, uh, Thursday's lake time, we all got to meet up on the uh, patio outside the worship center, and we got, we talked we talk to each other about what we think God's calling our youth group to do and what he has plans for Amen. us. Amen. Amen. So what's he, what's he calling a youth group to do? Um, well, I, it was kind of, it was unanimous. We all get the sense that uh, God's calling us to grow. Like, for a, we've been on kind of survival mode for a while at this point, but it feels like now we're getting the, uh, he's, we're getting the calling to be able to expand. Amen. Teach new people. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good job. Yeah, we want to grow, right? <laughs> Amen. Yeah, we can clap. <laughs> Amen. How about you, Bub? What did Jesus do for you this week? I think what he did for me is that he'll never leave us where we are and uh, that he'll be with us wherever we go. Amen. You, amen, yeah. I, I, feel like, I feel like you saw my sermon notes today. <laughs> uh, amen. What did Jesus do? Um, I was going to say kind of what Christian said about how we thought God was calling our youth group to grow and do big things. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. I love it. How about you, Brick? Um, for me, I was going to say the same thing as Christian and Isaac, but another thing that spoke to me was how we worshiped, and we all stood up, and we went to the front, and it was just really peaceful, and we loved to worship. Amen. Love it. Love it. How about you, Jacob? What do you feel like? You, you share what the Lord did for you and what you saw, so go for it. Um, the Lord... Um, really helped show that a small group and partners are really important to grow with each other and grow in the Lord. Amen. That's so good. That's so good. Good job. Go ahead, Maddie. So first of all, I just want to apologize for my voice because I think that's a, probably a good thing, right? I was screaming, cheering for the kids, but also praising the Lord. Um, I went to camp really expectant, you guys. I had never been to camp. This was my first time going to CTR. And I just absolutely love these teens, and I am so excited to see what the Lord's going to do with them. Um, so I went to camp, and I was like, let's do this. And then the first day, I was like, wait, like, what's going, like, it didn't, the building didn't fall to shambles. And I was like, wait, like, <laughs> I was ready for us to tear this place down. That's okay. 
but by the fourth, like it was still good. But by the fourth day, when we had that talk on the deck, you guys, like the Holy Spirit was in the middle of us. Like he was speaking to all of us that our youth group, we just all feel it. That word revival, the fact that pastor Michael is here, you guys, like I felt the word revival before I even started helping in the youth group. And then he came and he was a revivalist. We're like, what the heck? That's crazy. And now all of our teens are feeling like we're ready to expand. We're ready to go out, invite people into our youth group. We're ready to grow. We're ready to tell our friends about Jesus and also just grow as ourselves um, in our relationship with the Lord. So we're just really encouraged. We're excited. Um, and I just saw, I mean, the Holy Spirit is in this group of teens, you guys. You like, they are amazing. Amen. Amen. Yeah. All right. So let's just, let's extend our arms towards them. And we're going to pray for those that are here and those that couldn't make it. But Lord, we thank you for what you did in the hearts of our youth this past week. We thank you for what you did in the hearts of our workers as well. We pray that what you did in their hearts, that it does not wear off, that it's not just a week of camp and they come back and go about as business as usual, but I would pray would help launch them into the next 5, 10, 20, 50 years of their lives of loving you and serving you, Lord. We bless them today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys may be seated. Amen. Praise the Lord. That was wonderful. That's awesome. I love camp. I do love camp. I love it because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave lives inside of our teenagers as well. And, uh, and amen. Anyway. All right. Well, we're going to jump right into this. I'm ready. Amen. We're going to jump right into this. We're going to go back into redigging the wells this week, and it was based off that first Sunday that one of the points was that we were going, we were called to redig the wells of purity and power, because that's who we were. And 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 when you hear the word purity, immediately people think of, of immediately people think of sexual sin and things like that. That's that's part of it, but what we're really talking about is living a life of holiness and living a life of Christ-likeness. So, so I want you to think of it from that context today. But this is, again, it's, it's we're using that Genesis 26 passage that, that when, when Isaac went and dug the wells of his father, redug the wells of his father, he then hit flowing water. And that flowing water is the thing that brings life. And that's what I love about what was just said from our teenagers, that they're saying it's time to expand, it's time to invite people in. It's, it's time for God to do something to enlarge the family of God, right? And so how many understand that like God can speak to someone either by way of a dream or speak to him in the middle of the day, but more often than not, the Lord uses everyday ordinary people just like us to spread the gospel to those that do not know him. And that is what we are called to do. And so, so like we have that John 7, 36 passage that rivers of living water will flow from our innermost being. And so we're going to be a people that seek after God. We're going to be a people that sees him move. Now, as we get into this, I'll be honest, like as a, as a pastor for 13 odd years before we came here and then was on the road the last several years, and, and, and I, 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 it never ceased to amaze me. They'd say, we, we would want you to come and do a revival. We want you to come and teach and preach. And, and I'd show up and they're like, now you're not going to talk about the holiness stuff, are you? I'm like, why in the world did you even call me? <laughs> so here's, here's, I'm like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that entertaining. <laughs> like, I can't juggle or anything like that. Like, so I don't know what you want me to talk about. The, the biggest lie in the church today is that you can meet Jesus and stay the way that you are. It's, it's like, it's just false and like, well, I'm just this, that, and we'll get into this. But, but when you meet the one whose eyes burn like fire, you will be transformed. It's, it's a, it's, it's he transforms you in a moment and then you get to spend the rest of your life growing in that grace and becoming more and more like him. 
Like that, that's the good news of the gospel. The good news, is, again, I, I'm thankful he found me back in 2007. He didn't, by the way, he didn't find me. I, I mean, he found me. <laughs> he found me, but he waited until I got to rock bottom for me to finally realize that I needed him. But when I met him, he changed me in a moment. And too often times in the church, we tell people, we, and not, I'm being real careful because I don't want anyone to ever be upset, but, but it's, it's truth that sets people free. Too often times we give people coping mechanisms to manage what they wrestle with rather than saying the truth is you can actually be free. And not only can you be free, but you can be cleansed. And not only can you be cleansed, but you can be fully cleansed. All right. Amen. All right, C.B. Jernigan said this. C.B. Jernigan, uh, uh, um, one of the, he was a, he was the district superintendent of the Pioneer District of the early days in the church in Nazarene. So think like 1910, 1915, 1920s time period. But he, he said this. He said, whenever the doctrine, talking about holiness, or we would even say the word sanctification, that's going to be brought up today as well. But he would say, whenever this was preached, there was a mighty stir. And such power, such power as had seldom been seen in those days. And what he's saying is that when we start telling people that you don't have to live in cycles of dysfunction anymore, but you can actually be cleansed and set free, that it actually began to empower people to live this kind of a lifestyle of going after him. And by the way, when I say this lifestyle, I'm not talking about a list of do's and do nots. Because sooner or later, you're going to fail at that list. But if he gets a hold of your heart, and he begins to transform you from the inside out, it's a totally different thing. And so he, so, so he says that it caused a mighty stir. And, and like, I'm going to be honest, sometimes people would run them out of town, the ministers out of town. We don't want to hear that. We're comfortable where we are, right? Or, or we, we like what we do, or whatever it is. And he's saying that when this was presented, that God moved in a mighty way. And I'm very expectant that the Lord's going to touch some folks today. Because I don't know about you, I sure would like to see a mighty stir. I'd, I'd I'd like to see things that I've read about. I'd like to see things that, like Habakkuk said, you know, Lord, we've heard of your deeds. We know of your fame. Would you repeat them in our day? Like, like I, I want to see the things that I heard those that went before us say they saw, right? And it, not only for me, like, I want, by the way, if it's available, I want it. But, it but, but not only for me, but I want it for my kids. And I want it for my kids as kids in the future, right? And my kids as kids as kids. Like, I want them to see the glory of the Lord moving. I think, I think what better time to be alive than right now? I know I've shared this, but like I used to think I'd wanted to live in like the early 1800s or mid 1800s and then the late 1800s. And, and the, Lord's like, the Lord reminded me of what Mordecai told Esther that you were born for such a time as this. The Lord has ordained us to be alive during this hour because he believes that with his Holy Spirit living inside of us, we have what it takes to see the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and His Christ. Or the knowledge of the glory of the Lord cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Like the Lord, like I think, Lord, thank you for trusting us with this mass. It is a mess, but it's, but it's like, but, but we have one of two, re, I think we have one of two choices to respond to the mess. It's a mess. I can't wait till I get swept off the glory. And like, I'm thankful for when that's going to come. Or we could say, it's a mess. And I'm going to begin to pray and fast and intercede. And I'm going to see God turn this thing around on my watch so that those who come up after me don't have to spend their life cleaning up a mess. Like, that's the way I feel. All right. All right. So, with all that being said, let's get into this. I want to just briefly discuss who we are and what sin is. (laughs) 
2 Corinthians 5.21, there we go, says this, and I, this is one of my favorite verses, says, He who knew no sin became sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So if you have given your life to Christ, this is who you are. Or this, is, I'm pointing at my screen, this is who you are. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So I hear stuff like this. People say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Yeah, you were a sinner saved by grace. But you're no longer a sinner. Now you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's what describes you. And so it's like, and like I, I get it. Again, one of the biggest lies is saying that you sin every day in word, thought, and deed. And it's like, no, Jesus came and he died and he paid a higher price than for us to just get by and wait for him to come back. He came so that we might have life and life abundant so we could live a righteous or holy life day in and day out. Let me tell you, he who knew no sin, the word, the word sin, we, we, by the way, I'll tell you, I, I, I I ain't gonna tell it. I probably shouldn't. I'm gonna tell it. I had this. I, I, I had this phone call a year ago to go do a meeting. I won't tell you where, but I had to go do this meeting, and I was being told about this church and being told everything that's going on, and and they said, but you can't say certain words from the pulpit. I'm like okay, and I'm thinking like they don't want me to use I, I don't know slang or something like that or that's I know. I, Another word for not smart. Sometimes people get offended by that, right? And like, so, so, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say those things. He goes, no, 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 no. We don't say the word sin from from the pulpit. We say doing bad stuff. And I'm like, dude, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> One, you don't know what sin is. The word sin, right? It's not doing bad stuff. It is doing bad stuff. But the word sin, it's two words. When you look the word sin up in, in, in the Greek or the Aramaic, it's two words that were put together to become one. And I'm just going to briefly describe it. One is ha, and, and ha means without. And martia is the other part of that. And so they put those two words together. And martia, it means without merit, or, or you could even describe it as without blueprint. And so those that have sin issues, it's, it's realistically an identity issue. You're operating in a blueprint that God did not design for you. And when you don't live in that blueprint or that pre-designed intention that he has for you, then we start doing all these other things. One of, my, one of our friends, Ethan's, Ethan's going to be roommate with his son, but, but Jeremiah Bullock always says that if you only knew who you were, or if you only know who you are, if you only knew who you are, we could begin to walk this stuff out and live it out. So, so it means without, uh, um, really, it, it, sin means to be without an intended form or intended blueprint, if you will, or, or intended intention for us. And this leads to a bankrupted identity. And quite literally, we were born to bear the image of God. That's Genesis 1.26. Let us what? Make man in our own image. The Lord, the Lord... The Lord made us to show forth His excellency, His excellencies. The Lord made us to bear His image. And, and so when we start to identify with who we were or our dysfunction or our sin or whatever language I end up rattling off because I'm, I'm using like five different terms to say the exact same thing. When we live in something else, we don't begin, we, we fail to demonstrate His character, His heart, and His nature on the earth. And then we say, why isn't the church growing? Yeah. Now, I'm going to be on it like, if, if I was someone that didn't know Jesus, it'd be like, and we meet early here, like 9.30 early, right? <laughs> like, you mean to tell me you want me to wake up and go to a room and, and on, on my one day off at 9.30... To listen to some sweaty bearded guy holler at me 
And then he's going to say, I'd like you to give 10% of your income to the church. And then you all live the exact same way as I do day in and day out. I don't want to join your club. I'm trying to be silly, but you understand what I'm saying. See, when we begin to live this stuff out, it's not that we won't have the same issues and problems as everyone else because we will. We just have a different perspective and we can begin to live differently and respond differently. And they say, how are you so filled with hope when you're going through this dark time? And you can say, it's because what he's done in my heart. That speaks so loud. That speaks so, so loud. I'm I'm thankful for those that get up early, by the way. But he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness. You know what the word righteousness means? Like it does, someone will say it means right standing. It does mean right standing, but when you start to break it down, it means the blameless innocence. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the blameless innocence of God. By the way, before Christ, when they would sacrifice a lamb, they would take a lamb to the to the priest, and the priest would sacrifice the lamb on behalf of the, of the people to atone for their sins. The priest never inspected the person. The priest inspected the lamb. That was free. I thought that would go over a lot better. <laughs> so if I'm the blameless innocence of God... And we'll talk about how we get there here in a few minutes. But if I'm the blameless innocence of God, that means that it should be legal for me to say, I struggle every day in sin, thought, or word, thought, and deed. <laughs> I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm blood-bought. I have been washed by the blood, right? I have been cleansed by him. I've been cleansed by the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I'm, I am, yeah, I'm not saying that I am perfect. I am saying that he has washed me and he's empowering me to live this stuff out day in and day out. And if I slip and if I fall, I'm not going to stay there in the muck and the mire. I'm going to get back up and he's going to empower me to step forward and start living this stuff out again. I'm so, so thankful for that. See, the, the issue is this, is, is, that, is, that, is that who you are, who you are right now is not who you were and it's not who you're becoming. Let me say that again because that was really good. Who, who you are is not who you were and it's not who you're becoming. See here, let's have some fun for a few minutes. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, the new things have come. If anyone... Anyone will take a guess what anyone means? Anyone, Right? It's a terrible joke, and we'll do it every time. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. He's a new creature. The word, by the way, the word in means that we have been co-included with Jesus. In his death, we celebrate that in baptism, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We are co-seated with him. Actually, that's Ephesians chapter 2, that we've been seated with him in the heavenly places. But it means to be co-included with him. And so if we are living our life with Christ, we're a new creation, a new creature. Cre- creature means creation. It, it, means, it means something that you can't do under your own merit by trying harder. It means a work that's exclusively done by God. How many, how many of you, how many of you you've, you've been in a service and you've came down to the altars to ask God to do something in your heart to, and, and like you're like, I'm going to try really hard and by the next day you're doing that mess that you prayed for <laughs> That Sunday morning. Is that just me? Like two of you aren't Jesus' second cousin. So. <laughs> you can't try to be holy. It's something he does in your heart. Okay? It's not something you work yourself into. I wish someone had told me that 15, 16 years ago. 
because when I first was born again, I was trying my, like, I was, <laughs> it was, I was doing my best. I can't do this, this, and this, and this. The next thing you know, I'm really discouraged because I'm failing at all those things. It wasn't until he came and cleansed me and then empowered me to where it wasn't even, it's almost like this, these things that I used to struggle with, these things I used to struggle with, they weren't, occasionally they would speak and chirp at me, but I could look at it and say, I'm not interested any longer. (laughs) See, Jesus, he came to, he didn't come to reveal the potential us. He came to reveal the real us, and that's the real. He came to reveal us and cleanse us to such a degree that it's as if it never happened in the first place. So walking in purity means no longer identifying with who you were. Because who, who I am, again, it's not who I was, and it's not who I'm becoming, because I'm becoming more Christ-like every day. The problem is, is that we identify with who we were before Jesus more so than who we are after Jesus, right? I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And, and what, what do I mean by that? Well, I'll, I'll give you a couple real-life examples, and then I'll show you how we even condition people to think this way. If you used to struggle with drinking, you say, well, I'm just a drunk. No. If you've been set free, you're not a drunk. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Does that make sense? I'm not a product of my past. I'm not an angry person anymore. I've been set free. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not a product of who I was. See, we, we again, we've been conditioned to identify people this way. That's why, like, how many understand, like, in, in your, I want you to hear what I'm saying because I, I don't really want emails this week saying I said something I didn't say. It's true. We understand, like, we believe that these 66 books that can make up the Bible, we believe it was divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't Paul like, I think this would be a good thing to write. That's not what happened. The Holy Spirit spoke, and he wrote it down. Okay? Now, we went in afterwards, and we added verses and chapters, right, to make things more easily found. And then we took it a step further, and then we wrote, like, subheadings. So then you can look right here. Oh, it says Jesus stills the sea. So, like, God didn't put that in there. We did. That part was put in there so that we could help find things easier. Is everyone tracking with me? Okay. Because I don't want anyone to say. So, so then you read something like Luke 15, and it says the story of the prodigal son. Here's the issue. He's no longer prodigal. He's actually a redeemed heir right now because he came back home. Blind Bartimaeus, first name blind, blind, first name blind, second name Bart, right? (laughs) He's no longer blind. He's the man that Jesus healed his eyes. Are you following with me? The woman with the issue of blood, my wife's favorite message to teach and preach on, she's no longer the woman that's bleeding. She's now someone that can marry a man. She's now someone that's allowed to worship in the temple. She's now someone that can live her regular day-to-day life. Do you understand what I'm saying? What happens is, is that we condition people to identify with who they were before Christ, and the rest of their life they struggle thinking this is who they are. That's no longer who you are. That person's dead and buried. See, if you only knew who you are, And I, I'm I like, I'm not all for like, I'm not like, I, I don't, I'm not into like pep talks and trying to get people to like, like, if you knew who you are, then we could live up to the standard that God has called us to live. But if I'm, if I'm always living here, then I, I'm just not going to. So anyway, all right, I'm going to move forward because that horse is dead, but I think you guys got it. Yes. Praise the Lord. So how do we, how do we, like it it wouldn't do any good to say, okay, this is who you are now, go live it. Like how do you live this day in and day out? 
So we're going to give this momentarily, and then after this, we're just going to go, we're going to see the Lord move. How do we walk in purity and become more like him? Let me read this verse. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we, with unveiled faces, beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as the Lord is spirit. But we, with an unveiled, with an uncovered face, with, a, with, with, with nothing obstructing our view, are being transformed from glory to glory. You know what this is? This is living a lifestyle of prayer and worship. And you could say devotion, not doing, but living a life devoted to God. Prayer, worship, and I don't mean just on Sunday mornings. I mean on Monday morning or Monday night if you're a night out, whatever it looks like. But the more you look at him, the more you look like him. You've heard the phrase, you, you become what you behold. Some of us that's been married for any length of time are hoping we look more like our spouse. <laughs> that was a terrible joke. Anyway. <laughs> so the more we get along with God, and the more we worship him and the more we pray or the and not about like I'm doing 60 minutes not like but the more we live this life and the more we look at the lord the more we become transformed in his likeness but if it's if it's only this one hour a week like we're probably not going to see a lot of transformation in our lives we've got to live a lifestyle of pursuit of worship and prayer and devotion or being in the word whatever phrase you want to say and as we do that it's it's like this the more time i spend with him and it's it's something like it's easy to spend time with god when you're in this room i think but when you go get alone with him the lord puts his finger on exactly what he wants to transform and that's a little more hard. But he doesn't do it to make you feel guilt, shame, or condemnation. That's not from God. That's from the enemy. Conviction is a gift, and conviction is an invitation into something better than you're currently living in. And so the Lord, when we get alone with him, and I worship him, and I'm like, I, I'm so thankful today, God. I'm, you're, you're good. Your mercies are new every morning. I'm, thank, I'm thankful for this day. And and. And, and, and you are high and lifted up. God, you're the first and the last. You're above all. You're, you, you start going into that whole deal and start praying. And he's like, Michael, I want to talk to you about how you talked to this person the other day. And I'm like, I'm not here to talk about that, God. I'm here to like, <laughs> right? So what happens? I'd say, I'm sorry, I need your help. And then I go and tell that person I'm sorry. And what happens? He starts to make me more Christ-like. And then the more Christ-like you are, then someone says, can you tell me why you're the way that you are? And it's not because your family is weird. It's not because of any of that stuff. But it's because you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. All right. (laughs) So it's like, how do we live this out? Begin to worship him. Turn off the radio when you're going to work one day and put on a worship song. Or as you're making a road trip, listen to an audio Bible for a little bit. I don't know. Or wake up a few minutes earlier just to spend a few moments with the Lord. And now here's what I'm going to tell you about the Lord is that he's like, the Bible says he's a jealous God. So he's always going to ask for a little bit more. Lord, I'm waking up. I woke up 20 minutes today. I'm going to have 20 extra minutes I'm going to spend with you. That's great, Michael. Can you give me 21 tomorrow? Or can you finish your lunch just a few minutes quicker so you can steal away just a few more minutes with me? Like he's going to ask you and invite you into this. And it's not about time, but it's about time, if that makes sense. He's going, to, he's going to begin to ask you to worship him and adore him in a way. And I'm telling you, the, who you are right now, if you look in the mirror a year from now, you're going to look totally different than you are right now. Some of us, we don't even recognize the person we were 20 years ago. Praise the Lord for that, right? 
go back home to a high school reunion, like, who's that person? That, well, the guy you grew up with is dead. This is who you got now. I've been crucified with Christ. <laughs> the life that I now live. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's land this. I'm trying to take my time and be gentle <laughs> because I don't, want, I, I don't want anyone to think. The last thing I want anyone to think is that we're a bunch of legalists because that's not who I am. I'm someone that loves Jesus that wants other people to love Jesus. And as you love Jesus, he's going to transform you. So let's look real quickly what Jesus came to do. If you want to, put, put Luke 4 up there, guys, or, or, or team. Luke 4, you can turn to your Bibles as well. Luke 4, I love this passage. Jesus is quoting from the book of Isaiah. Jesus enters into the temple <laughs> and messes up the order of service because they weren't even supposed to read from this section that day. And Jesus goes and says this. He, he opens up the scroll of Isaiah and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the good news to the poor. He's, 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 he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of Jubilee or the favorable year of the Lord. So it's like, what did Jesus come to do? This right here. So, so if that's what he came to do, when we give our life to Christ, this right here is our inheritance. Meaning like, it's yours. He came, to, he, said, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now we know, we know that the Spirit of the Lord was in him because uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb. Like we know that, right? That's why he kicked Mary's womb when John was near. But, but, but then we know in Matthew chapter 3 that Jesus was baptized, heaven was rent, the heavens opened, and a Spirit came and descended upon him like a dove and it remained. And then out of the heavens the Father spoke and said this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased but here's what's fascinating to me is that is that he says the spirit of the Lord is upon me and if I can borrow another minister's statement we have the Holy Spirit inside of us for our benefit which cleanses us which is empowers us which leads us guides us directs us but then the Holy Spirit comes upon us we might you might hear someone say you're anointed or something like that and when it it comes upon you or he comes upon you it's not for your benefit if it's for the world around you's benefit like we ought to be a blessing in our workplaces like like that's that's what i'm talking about right here and so jesus said this like what what did jesus come to do he said well one he came to preach the gospel to the poor or the good news to the poor you know what this literally means? It means that, and not just, not just people that's not well off, like that, that, that is part of this, but an even deeper meaning to this verse is, is this right here. He came to preach good news and good tidings to those who are starving and living in a spiritual beggarly state. What does that mean? I'm hungry for God. And he says, I have good news for you. You can be filled with God. I'm searching for answers. I've got good news for you. <laughs> I am the answer, right? <laughs> That's what he came to do. And so there's all these questions and everything going on in the church and outside the church. And the good news of the gospel is all of our needs or all everything we need to know is found in the person of Christ Jesus. Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? The kingdom of God. He came to proclaim release to the captives. This is what I wanted to belabor quite a bit. Wow. He came to proclaim release to the captives. It means freedom for the brokenhearted. Forgiveness. When you look at freedom for the captives, it means forgiveness for those that are held captive by spear point, by guilt, shame, 
and condemnation. When you study that verse, that's what that means. What does that mean? It means that five years ago before I gave my life to Christ, if that's you and you did something, and every day when you go to worship and pray, that thing looks at you right square in the eye every single day. Does that make sense? You did something, you made a terrible decision when you were a teenager, and you have repented from that thing, you wouldn't even do that thing ever again, and yet that thing every single day is looking you right square in the eye, and Jesus came to remove the spear. Guilt, shame, condemnation, like, like how, and maybe it's just me. How many of you have, like, I'm going to spend time in prayer today, and you have asked God to, for, you, you asked God to forgive you something of 20 years ago, and then all of a sudden you go in the pray, and then you start to feel immense guilt, shame, and condemnation for something you repented of, and that thing is right back here, and then you spend your whole time repenting of something that he says, I, even I, who blots out their transgressions, I remember them no more, right? As far as the east is from the west, that's how far I cast their iniquities, right? <laughs> Like, 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 by the way, we say I can forgive and I can never forget, but that's not the way the Lord lives, so that's not the way God is, and I'm thankful for that because I have a squeaky clean resume now. When you start to go into that time and pray and that thing pops up, that's not the Lord there with a shovel waiting to dig up your past. That's the enemy. And so he came to set people free of guilt, shame, condemnation so what else did he do he came to give recovery of sight to the blind I'll I'll do this part quicker but he came to heal blind eyes I'm thankful for that those that don't know all my testament I used to you may those that have Facebook stalked I know some of you did (laughs) I used to have to wear glasses and the Lord touched my eyes, and I haven't wore glasses the last six years. And I was blind as a bat. Didn't ask for it, didn't do anything. I was, I, I, I was, I was sitting right about there in, in, a, in a service where people were standing up testifying how God had healed them, and I was just happy as I could be. And then I felt like the Lord spoke, and so I wrote, I was, got my little journal out to write down a note so I wouldn't forget it, and I put on my glasses, And I realized I couldn't see what was writing on the page. And I thought because I was terrible, I was lazy cleaning my glasses. So I thought they were just smudged, right? So I did this. And when I lifted them up, I could see. Put them down, couldn't see. And so I started doing this. And it doesn't matter how far away I sit from April, she can reach me with her elbow. (laughs) And she, she said, you're being a distraction. That's what she told me. And I said, I think God just healed my eyes. And she said, well, you better testify, right? So, like, the Lord can heal people's eyes. Like, I believe that wholeheartedly. But this also means he can give you a new perspective on life. What's that look like? Some of us, we say, some of us, may, I'm just a realist. No, you're probably a pessimist. And I, and I don't think pessimist, I don't, I don't, I don't think us as believers should be pessimists. I think we should be the most hopefully optimistic people on the planet. Where everyone else sees death, loss, and destruction, we see a garden about to spring up, right? Where everyone else sees a desert, we see a river about to come forth. Everyone else sees a mountain, well, I'm getting excited because I'm going to tell that mountain be cast into the sea, right? Or someone else sees a valley, that's okay, that valley's going to be raised up and I'm going to walk on level ground. Like, that's the difference. It's a change in perspective. And it's like, man, or it's like, man, <laughs> I've got all these problems, but you know what? He's still good. He's still in charge. He's still on the throne. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. And he said, I'm going to walk through it. He didn't say I was going to pitch a tent and live there, which means that I'm going to get to the other side of it eventually. And I believe this because I have a different perspective. Some of us, we need a different perspective. And by the way, don't hear this as condemnation. Like this here, this is an invitation into becoming who you are, and it's an invitation into freedom this morning. And Cheryl, I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind start coming on forward. He came to set free those who are oppressed. This is kind of what we touched on at the beginning. But he came to set free 
prisoners. It quite literally means those who are bruised and traumatized by life are now restored to their original innocence. What does that mean? Some of us have been through stuff. Probably all of us in the room have been through stuff. Some of us have been deeply hurt and wounded. Friends, family. Some of us have been hurt by church. Let's be honest. I won't say that. But he came to set people free and heal or bind up those wounds. Amen. not being arrogant when I say like I know the Lord's in the room right now so I, I, I know the Lord and he's here this morning I believe with all of my heart to come and touch some people if you're in the room and I, I don't know how to I, like I don't know how to end this like I I should. <laughs> but I know there's some folks in here that, that, that God would like to touch and to cleanse and to change and to transform and to heal people's hearts. And if that's you, I'm going to ask you to slip out of your seats and we're going to spend a few minutes to pray. If you're in the room and you're tired of wrestling with the exact same things over and over and over again, I want you to come on up here and we're going to pray. And not at once, that way we don't fall over each other. But if that's you, I want you to come. It just takes one to open up the floodgates. If you're in here and you've wrestled with your identity and not feeling worthy to be loved by God or You've identified with who you were before you met Jesus. I'm going to belabor just a minute because I feel it in my bones. It's not a guilt, shame, or condemnation thing because I believe, I believe the Lord's just going to help some people today. So here's what I'd ask. As you see, I want to spend a few moments, and like th this is the most important thing we could possibly be doing right now. And then we'll move forward to the next thing. But if you see someone up here and you're like, I'm, I'm burdened to come pray with them, and church board, if you feel burdened to come and pray, or I want you to maybe just come and put your hand on one of them up here. And if someone else is like, if you're back there and you're like, ah, there's more people up here so it's safer for me to come up front and pray. I'm okay with that too. But we're going to just spend a few minutes and pray and then I'm going to pray over the whole body today.
just going to ask you to stay in a, just a posture of prayer for a few more minutes, church, okay? God, God's here, and he's, he's touching people. So, Father, I, as, as people's praying, we're still going to have room for that. But I would pray for those that came forward and even those that didn't. I pray they would begin to experience everything that you died for them to experience and live in. And as George has prayed it. But I, I pray, Lord, that you would restore the joy of people's salvation this morning. I pray it would no longer be a labor. It's not, oh. I have to open up my Bible. Oh, I have to pray. No. I pray that the word becomes alive in ways that it's never been alive before. I pray those old familiar stories that God speaks in brand new and fresh ways. I would pray, Lord, that the years of guilt and shame and condemnation that many have walked with, that, th that they may not even told their closest loved ones, I pray that those things would fall off of folks and that they would walk and live in everything that you have. I would pray that the things that people struggle with, we say, we say no more, God. Especially a lot of things we struggle with, it comes by way of when we get stressed out and we run to something for comfort. We say no more, Lord. May you break that cycle today. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for what you're doing in this room. And I would pray that it does not wear off after folks go home but I would pray that we do what even that verse said that we go from glory to glory instead of from glory to off <laughs> and so father we love you and we thank you I thank you for what you're doing here today it's in Jesus mighty name we pray amen amen God bless you God bless you you're dismissed church amen <laughs>